welcome to the Bloomberg Markets Magazine interview. I'm Shanali Basak. For every Markets Magazine, we go in depth with a key newsmaker, an industry up and comer, or a disruptor. And this time we spoke to Max Levchin, the CEO and founder of a firm. He doesn't think you should be buying a cup of coffee on a revolving credit line and have to pay it off over the next decade. And that could be the elevator pitch for a firm and other players in the world of buy now, pay later finance. BNPL, as it's often called, promises to be an alternative to high interest credit cards and a lifetime of debt. And the concept is nothing new. A customer pays for a $1,000 television and pays for it over four $250 payments. And at a firm, it acts like a 0% loan. But if a customer pays late, then many of a firm's rivals will charge late fees. The use of BNPL has exploded in recent years with more than 24 billion in BNPL loans estimated to have been created in 2021, according to a critical analysis by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But as BNPL has gone mainstream, it has attracted more competition with PayPal and Apple joining the fray and more regulatory oversight with the CFPB concerned about some aspects of the model. Here's Max Levchin on what caused the buy now pay later revolution. America runs on credit, and that's not a bad thing. You can borrow today to go to school and get a better education and have a marketable degree, and we buy homes on credit so that we have a nice place to live and build a family and create more opportunities for American economy to grow from the labor of our children. So, so credit is not a bad thing at all. The problem with credit that on the consumer side of things, it devolved into what should be known as buy now and pay forever, which is lines of credit you know, on a piece of plastic known as credit cards. If you are not extraordinarily well-to-do, and that's vast majority of Americans, you will eventually find yourself revolving, which is you're carrying a balance and you don't know exactly when you're going to be out of debt. And you seem to be paying and paying and paying, and yet your total indebtedness doesn't seem to be going down very much. Around 2008, an entire generation of what were then kids who are now millennials saw what happens to their parents who were knee deep in debt and didn't know exactly how to get out of it and realized that there's got to be a better way. The birth of buy now, pay later, and in particular, what we call internally honest finance, which is what a firm wants to be or is, is this idea that there's got to be a better way. Instead of buying now and paying forever, maybe you could have certainty and control around your personal finances that does not require walking around with an Excel spreadsheet at all times. All of that is a secular momentum that began years ago, and we were there to, to, to grow with it. A firm in particular, and by now pay later writ large, is the secular shift by young consumers away from revolving credit and credit cards into much simpler to understand pay over time individual transactions. You were talking about the post-2008 generation and the worry about their parents uh, being saddled with debt. But there's another generation that is still saddled with debt. Now they're credit card debts, uh, student loan debts, uh, and debts tied to homes if you can afford it. How do you speak to kind of the financial habits of this country and what might need to change? Yeah, I think we're doing our part when we speak to the entire American populace, and by the way, we're, we're now live in Canada and uh, certainly aren't planning to stop in just the two North American giants. We, we have plans for a worldwide version of, of this, this company, but we do see our job as as much a tool for purchasing as a guide or co-pilot, if you will, in your financial decisions. Our job is to help you make sound financial decisions every time you're deciding to buy or not buy, to finance or not finance. And it's a big job, but somebody has to do it. And we, we think we're up for it. How are the financial habits of other places in the world different than perhaps what we're seeing in this country and even Canada? The good news is that a lot of the world is already buying things on installments. So we're not bringing in an entirely new idea. and a lot of the world runs on credit very cautiously, as in they are prone to looking at financing things through the same lens as we are. And so, you know, ask me again how we're doing in other countries when we launch there, but we feel very optimistic that the demand for the honest financial products as we interpret them is going to be significant everywhere, not just North America. 
about a year or so ago when Jamie Dimon was asked about his biggest competitors. We talk about this a lot, that he name-checked a firm, that uh, you uh, and your model was one of the biggest kind of incumbents to the traditional financial industry. However, the banks have also seemingly begun to partner with you more, uh, particularly regional banks. What role do they play in your lifespan? I find it very flattering that someone as, as you know, at the very top of the most powerful bank in America sees us as an important competitor. I don't think it's a statement about us. It's a statement about the idea that revolving on a cup of coffee is a model that's probably going to go away over the next few years. So I, I think that's that's good news. Very large. Do you think that the buy now, pay later model creates new risks to an industry that are maybe underappreciated from the get go? You know, I think buy now, pay later model creates risks for credit cards. And frankly, it's a good risk that I'm I am happy to you know add fuel to that particular fire. You should not revolve on a cup of coffee. You should not feel that you have no idea when you'll be out of debt. Buy now, pay later, and firm in particular are the predictable outcomes product that is an alternative to the completely unpredictable version that is offered to you by traditional credit card issuers. Max, you're kind of uh, leading this hard charge, it seems, to kill the credit card. Where does this come from in you? I'm definitely not trying to kill the credit card. I think there are folks for whom credit cards are probably perfect. A lot of them live on coasts, make six or more figures in salary, and really enjoy their airline miles and perks and benefits, et cetera. But I do think a tremendous number of people in, quote unquote, normal America, I grew up after immigrating from Ukraine, I grew up in central Illinois, went to school in central Illinois. There are plenty of people who revolve. Half of this country revolves on a $5,000 plus. I don't think it's a good thing. I think we would be a financially healthier nation if we knew how to borrow intelligently and not overextend ourselves. So it's not a quest against something. It's a quest for healthier financial lives for everyone who doesn't live in New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco. Coming up, how buy now, pay later firms are responding to higher interest rates. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the Bloomberg Markets Magazine interview. I'm Shanali Basak. BNPL has been rising in popularity, but so has credit card debt. Take a listen to just how much Americans have loaded up on borrowing. Households in the U.S. have racked up more than $17 trillion worth of debt through the third quarter of 2023. While the lion's share of that is mortgages, what can't be ignored is the stunning rise of credit card debts past $1 trillion. It's an emotional level for an industry that's quickly growing. And with more credit card debt, there are also more delinquencies. Still, by comparison to credit cards, the buy now, pay later market is small. Globally, it's estimated to be over $300 billion for 2023, according to consulting firm Global Data. It's growing at such a significant rate that it could hit more than $565 billion in 2026. Global Data's report warned of the risks to such growth, saying that if a borrower defaults, it could add more to their total debt load. And the more debt and fewer repayments means more late fees for customers. Global Data says that customers' credit scores could ultimately be negatively impacted and that the industry could use more regulations. And this echoes the CFPB concerns in a 2022 report, which cites the rapid growth of the BNPL model, a whopping tenfold increase in just two years through 2021. The Bureau said that one risk was that customers could become overextended, taking out too many BNPL loans across too many lenders. Now, the debts have piled up just as the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates at the fastest pace since the days of Paul Volcker, leaving Americans vulnerable to more expensive debts. And the move also caught some businesses off guard, most notably with the regional bank collapse of SVB. And with such an interest rate sensitive business, I asked Max how a firm is responding to a higher for longer environment. 
as the Fed hiked the rates at the unprecedented pace all through last year, we had to adapt and move with it. Obviously, we are not a bank. We are not a depository. Therefore, we don't just have capital sitting around for lending purposes. We have to go borrow or sell our loans to buyers. As the price of money went up, so we had to figure out how to finance our business, our loans appropriately. The good news is that we're able to maintain our margins and this notion of higher for longer doesn't scare me one bit. You're seeing the number of charge-offs start to rise at a lot of banks. And even with higher interest rates, credit card debt in the United States has surpassed a trillion dollars, a really landmark moment. So what does this mean for customers of yours for interest rates to be higher for longer? The thing that I would like to believe it means for our customers is they will use a firm a lot more than they use their traditional credit cards. We are a better product. We are a viable replacement for credit cards. And that's because we give you a sense of control by always disclosing exactly what the cost will be upfront. We don't charge late fees. We don't allow you to revolve. We don't have these ridiculous different interest schemes embedded in our products at all. And so it's a better product and higher for longer, I think, means more people will use a firm. Are you saying that higher for longer, higher interest rates means more people will be, will be using buy now, pay later? And why is that? Buy now, pay later means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So I'll just speak to a firm. I do think that higher for longer means people will need and crave certainty and clarity around cost of credit. When you're borrowing money and it costs you more money than it did during the zero interest rate environment, you want to know exactly when you'll be out of debt. You want to manage your cash flow much more precisely because every dollar counts and inflation definitely doesn't help that. And so credit cards, which are these power tools with safety off where you put it on your plastic and then you're not really sure how you're going to get out of debt, are not great in this kind of environment. Do you worry that as more customers look to a firm or to buy now pay later models in particular, that the expansion of a demand will lead to also uh, more loose credit underwriting standards in your industry? Again, uh, it's very hard to speak for the rest of the industry, but I think we made our name and our results over the last, certainly over the last year and last decade of operating in having the best and the most thoughtful underwriting controls. As you saw delinquencies rise over the last several quarters for a bunch of credit issuers, we kept ours essentially flat to down. You need a near perfect credit score to get a credit card or to get an auto loan or a home equity line of credit in this country. With that kind of tightening of credit standards across many of the traditional lenders, do you think that that's fueled alternative types of lending, particularly what you do at a firm and buy now, pay later? Banks sell these fairly archaic tools that are one size fits all. You get a card, you use it for everything. You don't really know when you're gonna get out of debt. And on the risk management side, the bank commits to a multi-year relationship where maybe something changes for you. A firm is a much better model because we underwrite every single transaction separately. As we look at the item you're trying to buy at the personal financial circumstances of the person borrowing, we can tell you, hey, this is a good idea. Or we can say, you know what? This is more than we think you can afford. These are the nicest messages sometimes to offer to consumers, but they're far healthier financially. Max, what's the future of FICO? FICO is the lingua franca, the sort of the venerable credit score that's been around for a very, very long time. And it captures the financial reality of a lot of people. It also excludes a fair number of people in part because it doesn't consider all the information that can be gathered from the consumer as you make an underwriting decision. It also just overlooks people who don't have a rich credit profile. I'm an immigrant. When I came to the US 30 years ago now, I existed, but my credit score didn't because there was no history. And so FICO in and of itself needs to continue evolving. We announced that we will be partnering with them to help them come into the buy now, pay later age by working with them to uh, incorporate some of the variables that we have figured out how to use for better underwriting. So I don't think they're going anywhere. I think they're they're going to continue to be the uh, the dominant name in underwriting. When you're taking credit decisions into account, what type of data are you collecting about consumers that are maybe broader than a traditional credit card company or bank? The FICO score speaks to just the person and their overall financial health and their past ability and willingness to repay their bills. 
it's very broad and kind of a good foundation, but to approve or decline someone to a specific purchase means you kind of have to understand what the purchase is. And we do do that. And I think that's ultimately the future of underwriting. You mentioned the fact that you were an immigrant and couldn't get um, a card when you came here because of that and the credit history that you did or didn't have. So are there things about the person themselves uh, at the borrower that you have to take into account? Yes, although that's a significantly harder thing. First of all, there's a tremendous amount of privacy concerns that you want to be on the right side of. The one thing that you can and we do sometimes get access to, and it's profoundly, could be a life-changing access to credit moment for some folks, it's personal financial state as seen through the lens of their bank account. If I understand your personal cash flow, it doesn't really matter what the credit history says. That's a financial picture that is very, very difficult to capture in your credit bureau profile. And that's primarily what the FICO score is built off. And so there are hidden facets of consumers that we know how to look at and many traditional scores do not. There are a lot of buy now, pay later companies. When you are buying now, paying later, sometimes you can pay or buy now, pay later with your credit card. That means that you are borrowing money and then you're borrowing again on a credit card. Does the model itself create new risks? That seems like leverage on top of leverage, Max. A firm is not an add-on to your credit card. It's a replacement. That's the idea. So what you're describing is a behavior that we do not encourage and, in fact, very actively try to prevent consumers from doing. We launched our Affirm card with a very clear view that, hey, you can put that credit card back into a drawer and never take it out. The Affirm card is both debit and the borrowing capacity in a single product, but both are safe. They're both Affirm-powered pay later features where you will either settle your bill quickly or you'll pay over time, but there are no late fees, there's no revolving, there's no leverage on leverage. Something I wonder about the credit product is, is this kind of showing you that the buy now, pay later model is not the end all be all, that in some ways the credit model works even better? The Affirm card is not a credit card. It is a debit card, first and foremost. When you swipe it, and move on, it will take money out of your checking account, your existing checking account, the end. That takes two to three days to settle, but that is not a credit transaction. It is a payment. You can say, hey, that thing I'm gonna buy, I am going to borrow for this because it's more than I have in my checking account. The card says, oh, great, I know what to do next. So when you swipe it, the next transaction sort of automatically becomes a loan. Those two modalities, it's unique. No one's ever done this before. It's a very, very different product. It's taken us a little bit of time to figure out how to educate the consumer about it, how to make it all work from compliance and risk and underwriting and cost perspective, but it is not a credit card. It is an anti-credit card, in fact. So what is the purpose of the credit card for you? Credit cards are kind of a cold burning plant of the payment industry. I think it's time to uh, abandon them in favor of cleaner energy alternatives like the firm card. But why is a firm card an answer to the credit card? The credit card is you swipe it, you revolve, you buy now, and you pay for indeterminate amount of time, possibly forever. A firm card is a fixed term loan for every transaction. There is no revolving. There is no bucket of debt to fill up and then figure out later. It's a much simpler, higher control product. Coming up, the future of Buy Now, Pay Later. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the Bloomberg Markets Magazine interview. I'm Shanali Basak. The future expansion of Buy Now, Pay Later appears bright, but that kind of success also comes with scrutiny from the CFPB working on regulations for the sector. I asked Max how he views potential regulation and then also what private equity snapping up Buy Now, Pay Later loans means and how a firm is working with the regional banks to help alleviate duration risk. The Collapse of SVB and the turmoil around regional banks showed us that 
duration risk is just as big of a deal as credit risk. Regional banks watch this with horror and then ask themselves, all right, so who manufactures loans that yield well, are fairly short term, are liquid, and are really well managed in terms of credit? And there's not a long list. A firm is one such company. And so we've seen tons of interest from regional banks, super regional banks, anyone who's got significant consumer deposits. This is a great place for them to put their money to work, and we will take good care of it in very short-term increments. What's the difference for you between working with a bank, a regional bank, or a private credit firm, which have been increasingly more important as the banks have been shrinking? They're also insurance companies work with. We work with larger banks. We also securitize our loans. And with really big banks, we have multiple warehouse lines where if we feel that we want to hang on to these loans on our own balance sheet, we'll warehouse them. And so in aggregate, it adds up to a very healthy ecosystem of funding. And our cost of capital is something that we report on every quarter. Obviously, these things have some amount of lagging effect, whereas some of these deals renew, we renegotiate to reflect the recent changes in the Federal Reserve action. But ultimately, the, it is the plurality and the diversity of the funding ecosystem that we have created that has allowed us to maintain our margins and also deliver good yields to our partners. You saw earlier this year, KKR, for example, agreed to buy as much as $44 billion of buy now, pay later loans from PayPal. And could you see yourself doing a deal so large? I certainly can see us getting to that scale at some point reasonably soon. So I, I feel great about uh, the precedent that's been set here. Obviously, can't comment about any deals that are not public knowledge yet. But uh, certainly the model, that, that that particular deal proves a model and frankly, I think creates another sort of stamp of approval on the buy now, pay later industry. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in particular has raised a lot of concerns about the buy now, pay later model. What kind of future regulation do you see or clampdowns on the industry um, that could really change the way it works? I think regulation, when done right, is a good thing. It creates equilibrium settings in the market, allows for fair competition, protects consumers. So all of that I am generally in favor of. I think by now, pay later industry, except for a firm, as, as is frequently the case, should not be unchecked in its fee schedule setting. But there's plenty of late fee harvesting, as they call it, taking place in buy now, pay later. And a little bit of a spotlight from the regulators wouldn't hurt. In places like credit reporting, you should be able to build your credit score by using buy now, pay later providers in a predictable way. And today, we report majority of our competitors do not. I think, writ large, if you are building a company that is committed to transparency, as we very much are, regulatory attention is a cost. I think we should expect more regulation, more attention. I don't think it's going to be a dramatic change, of course, for us. I kind of hope it causes some dramatic changes for some of the folks that have already figured out business models that, frankly, are not particularly pro-consumer. That's all for this episode of the Bloomberg Markets Magazine interview. You can find more from Max at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the latest issue of Bloomberg Markets Magazine. I'm Shanali Basik, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.